Welcome everyone to FARA Flash Talks. Um, so FARA Flash Talks are a series that we started uh, several years ago as a way to recognize Redux Awareness Day and month throughout the month of May. And we thought that it was important not only to raise awareness about Friedrich's ataxia outside our community, but also within our FA community and, and help our community members understand what kinds of research are going on. And in a, in a fun and unique way where we get to highlight the work of junior investigators in the FA community. And so, um, the folks presenting and sharing their research with you today are graduate students and postdocs um, doing research um, in, in the laboratory. We have um, a terrific lineup today, um, a very international lineup. We've got four different um, countries represented among our researchers today. And we've asked our young investigators to put together for you um, a five minute presentation using only one slide and try and share their research, um, not as if they're presenting to a scientific audience, but presenting to a lay audience and really want to you know, help our FA community understand the kinds of research that, that they're involved in. And we have two FARA ambassadors who will be helping to moderate today's discussion. So after each presentation, um, our moderators will open the, the floor for questions. And there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and you can submit questions there and we'll ask um, our, our, our presenters the questions that you submit. Just as a reminder, the session for today is being re recorded. Uh, we also would like you to keep your browser open at the end of the session because we um, have voting for your favorite flash talks. Uh, we're giving out prizes to our young investigators who have submitted abstracts and who are presenting to you throughout the month. And so they would appreciate your, your votes at the end of the session. And let's see, um, I think that takes care of most of our, oh, one more housekeeping item. Um, the other activity that we have ongoing for FA Awareness Month is our Lend Us Some Muscle campaign. And so this is how you can be involved in raising FA awareness um, on social media. And so Farah has a, a lot of fun tattoos that we can send out to you and you can um, sport the tattoos and some fun um, flexing poses and put them out on social media with the Lend Us Some Muscle tag. All right. Now back to business of um, research and flash talks. We have um, lined up for today. Our two moderators are Brian Happy and Kaylee New City. And I'm gonna turn it over to them in just a minute um, once I give you a little bit of an overview. So we try and um, put the flash talks together in a theme. And so today's theme is different types of research that um, are looking to explore different therapeutic approaches. And so we've learned a lot since the gene has, was identified 27 years ago. We know the mutation that causes uh, FA, the GAA repeat expansion in the Frataxin gene. We know that Frataxin is caused by um, low expression or low amounts of Frataxin protein. And frataxin protein is important because it, it has a vital role in specific cellular functions. And it's those cellular um, functions that, you know, when there's frataxin deficiency, it's like a cascade effect. Um, you end up with cellular dysfunction, and that would, that's what leads to the symptoms that cause FA. And so there are different ways to think about therapeutic approaches. It could be at the cellular dysfunction level, it could be at the protein level, it could be at the gene level. And so today, each of our different presenters kind of give us a different way to think about approaching um, drug discovery or therapeutic approaches by targeting um, different parts of this pathway that are part of Friedrich's ataxia. And so with that, um, 
I am going to turn the flash talks now over to our moderators. And I believe, um, Brian, you're going to introduce our first speaker today. Hi, everyone. My name is Brian Happy. Um, I'm a FARA ambassador. And uh, I was actually diagnosed with FA in 2020. Um, our first speaker today is Fred Edzema, Edzema, uh from Brunel University in London. Um, and I hope you guys enjoy his presentation. Thank you very much, Brian. Let me share my screen in a moment. Yeah, so good afternoon. And my name is Fred Ejami, and I'm a PhD student in Dr. Sarah and Germani Vermonis lab in Bruno University of London. Um, I'm interested in FB research because growing up as a young scientist, I from my undergraduate, I got to know about rare diseases and much attention has been given to patients with rare diseases. So I want to be part of a group of scientists who in the future or now will find treatment to FA patients. Uh, also by extension to other rare diseases. I'll begin my presentation with a short story of um, a philanthropist who lived in the community and uh, for some time was known as the life support for that community. However, after some time, this philanthropist, after engaging with some group of people, uh, has developed to become a bad person, a serial killer. He's been having this uh, effect in the community, killing people, and then has to be arrested. I went before court and denied bail, and then remanded to police custody for further investigations. My topic is investigating the therapeutic effects of different antioxidants in Friedrich ectaxia. And in my storyline about African liking that philanthropist who was a life support to that community to oxygen, which we learned to survive. However, oxygen can develop into oxygen radicals after interacting with other molecules in the body. And these oxygen radicals uh, have been found to be highly accumulated in FA patients. So when we have the accumulation of these oxygen radicals, it's supposed to kill cells in the patients. And cells which are vulnerable to these oxygen radicals are the cells in the brain to some extent, the cells in the heart as well. When this happens, it worsens the FA patient's condition, as you can see from the first flow chart, which is up. I am looking at antioxidants, and we are looking at how we can mitigate the effect of these oxygen radicals by stopping the radicals themselves and not waiting for the effects, not waiting to target the effects of the radical. So we are looking at antioxidants. So as you can see from the figure below, the last uh, at the bottom, we are blocking the oxygen radicals using the antioxidants. And these are compounds you get from fruits. So vitamin C is included, um, chanteau humor is included, other natural products are included. So what we are doing is to treat cells we've obtained from FA patients with these antioxidants. And we've, we've observed so far that we are having a significant reduction in the levels of these oxygen radicals. And that could mean that our cells are surviving. So there is increased cell survival. And once you're able to protect the cells from this toxic effect of the oxygen radicals, it means that this is going to translate into some improvement in the lives or in the symptoms of the FA patients. So as we've discovered this, we are also moving ahead to do further investigations to see which other effects are these antioxidants we've obtained having in the cells, which can be translated into the patients. So we hope that by the end of my study, I'll put forward some antioxidants, some compounds, which can be investigated further uh, and used to mitigate the effect of oxygen radicals in FA patients. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. All right. 
Um, it looks like we have our first question from Mary. Um, she says, thank you for this great work. Uh, do you have any specific antioxidants that you found more helpful than others? Yeah, so, so far we've found uh, vitamin C to be very uh, helpful. And looking at the way it acts, we are also trying to see if we can combine vitamin C with DMF and see if we can have some um, synergistic effects or, we can, or if we can combine vitamin C with n cysteine. So from the natural products, vitamin C stands tall uh, as we speak, yeah. Okay. Uh, Fred, just to piggyback off that, uh, one of the questions I had, uh, the DMF and the n acetylene is that commonly found in any foods or is that more of a supplementation? Yeah, so for n acetylcysteine, minor fruit like broccoli will find minor levels, but higher levels are found in animal proteins and amongst other things. But we are looking, these are drugs that have already been established in literature to have some effect on free taxing gene. But you want to see what new compound from natural products can we add to augment the functions of this compound to get some synergistic effects, which would be stronger than, let's say, using DMF alone or using n acetylcysteine alone. So we are keeping those which we already know in literature there, and you are looking for new ones to combine with what we already know. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um. Okay, we have another question from Michael. Uh, would these antioxidants work together with uh, OMAV, uh, Skyclaris, the new drug that was just approved? Yeah, thank you very much. That is what we are aiming at because we believe in combination therapy a lot. And that if it's working in synergy, then you're having a very stronger effect. OMAV has been wonderful, although it has its own side effects and it's all downside, but overall, it's, it's been a very powerful compound so far. So if you're able to come out with something new, I'm sure it will just be in the better interest of every patient to have a combination, which will be less toxic to them, which will have less side effects, but will give them a much stronger therapeutic uh, effects. And then this together, you know, will help improve the lives of the patients. Yeah. So we hope forward to see if it can work. We are hoping for such combinations as well. Uh, okay, the next question we have is from Jason. Um, why do you think some antioxidants are better than others? Yeah, that's because one, what we've also observed with this antioxidant is they act differently. So for instance, you may have vitamin C, which is scavenging, looking out for the rose and deactivating them if you like. You have others like DMF that has to go and activate another pathway to upregulate antioxidant genes. Okay, so these are different means by which the compounds are acting. And so when you treat them, they're likely not to find the same response because even for those of us, for those cell lines we are using, the same cell line, you do the treatment, you're having different responses. So the cells from individual patients are responding differently. And so these antioxidants, their main effects may be dependent on how they act. So if the activity, their mode of, the mechanism of action is not the same, you don't, you don't expect to see the same outcome. So others, by, by means their action, they're able to give us a much stronger and better effect than others. So we can base that on their mechanism of action. Okay, right. uh, Jen, could I just ask one more question? Yes, of course. One more sure. question. Yep. Um, Fred, I was under the impression that, you know, this oxidative stress of the ROS damage, uh, you know, leads to long-term uh, changes or mutations in the cell. Um, is it your belief that antioxidants 
can reverse that over time or is it more of stopping it where where it is yeah so we want to reduce the ROS, the production of the oxygen radicals at all costs to the barest minimum but the effect that we see usually is not like once you stop it nothing's happening something else is happening because they are not just killing cells they are oxidizing dna they are they are having several effects in the cell so once we are able to reduce the level we can clear everything out that one that's that truth has to be stated but you want to reduce the impact of the ROS. yeah thank you all right, well, I think we're gonna have to move on to our next speaker. Um, Fred, there's one more question in the chat, in the Q&A, so maybe if you have time during the um, session, if you wanna answer that, you can you can even type in an answer. Okay, that's fine. And uh, I think Kaylee's gonna introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Hello, I am Kaylee Newsty. I am a Thera ambassador for I think three years now. I am 31. I live in Louisiana and I was diagnosed. I was misdiagnosed first in 15 with CMT and then correctly diagnosed in 2017 with FA. So that is a little about me. Um, for our second presenter, we have Christian Watt from CNRS Brands. And Christian will be talking about searching for frataxin, placing molecules through virtual screening. So Christian, if you are ready, you can go ahead. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, so I'm a PhD student currently studying in Paris as part of the research team led by Benoit Dautrieu. And before this, I was studying at the University of Leeds in England, which is where I'm from. Uh, so I've titled my talk Searching for Frataxin Replacing Molecules Through Virtual Screening. So our project is concerned with identifying small molecule drugs that can directly replace frataxin in the body of people with FA. So to try and make the, the talk easier for all audiences to follow, I've kind of split my talk into two halves. So on the top half is a slightly more uh, complicated half, which has the real 3D protein structures that we're using. And then on the bottom is a hopefully more understandable analogy I created to explain the system. Uh, so feel free to focus on either the top or the bottom because they, they tell the same story. Uh, so let me start by just giving a quick overview of frataxin. So frataxin is a protein found in the body and proteins are generally large organized molecules that do specific things uh, such as making chemical reactions happen. And in the case of frataxin, it's, uh, it's really useful when it sticks to some other proteins. So when these proteins come together, uh, which I've shown in blue, red and frataxins in green, uh, we call it a complex. And this complex specifically, it has the role of producing little molecules called iron sulfur clusters. And iron sulfur clusters have a range of different functions, uh, but one of the ways you can think of them is kind of little batteries which help the, the body function. So in FA, there's, a, there's an issue in producing frataxin. Uh, so not much frataxin is actually produced, and this means that the complex isn't always complete. And therefore it's not as good as making the iron sulfur clusters. So at our lab, we're working on trying to find small molecules that have the potential to become a drug to replace frataxin. So we're really looking for uh, small molecules that interact in the same way with the complex as frataxin, uh, which can also functionally replace frataxin and therefore help restore the iron sulfur cluster production. So there's millions of small molecules out there, which have been made by chemists all over the world. And these are typically stored in chemical libraries. And we're trying to find the ones which can be administered uh, to people with FA to try and replace the shortage of frataxin in the body. So to physically randomly test so many small molecules to see if they can replace frataxin, it takes a lot of time and it's not quite as efficient as we'd like it to be. Uh, so to make the process a lot more efficient, we first do something to uh, computationally identify which molecules are most likely to replace frataxin. And we do this through a process called virtual screening and then after that, we can order these for testing in the lab. So what is virtual screening? So virtual screening is kind of like using a computer to complete a puzzle for us. So we give the, the computer the structure of our complex, which is missing for taxin. So this is the incomplete puzzle. 
And we also give it uh, thousands and thousands of puzzle pieces or small molecules. And we then ask the computer to basically find which puzzle pieces best fit into the puzzle. And then the computer tries to fit each puzzle piece one by one. And um, some of the pieces, no matter how hard we try, uh, they just don't fit into the puzzle very well. But then on the other hand, some fit in really nicely. And uh, it's the ones that fit in really nicely that we're actually interested in. So we calculate how well they fit by something called their predicted binding affinity. And this basically tells us if they stick uh, well or, or not so much. So already we tested around 80,000 molecules this way. So this, um, all of these molecules came from the National French Chemical Library. And this is a facility that stores a lot of the, the molecules produced in, um, by chemists in France. And so using this method, we found a lot of molecules which are most likely to be able to replace rituxin. So on the far right of the, uh, of the slide is basically an example that fits nicely. And then this illustration, it shows that we can really uh, zoom in on the small molecule and see exactly how this interacts. And this is important because it helps us uh, to improve or to rationally design these molecules to make them fit even better. So after we finish finding a lot of the tight binding molecules through virtual screening, we then order them into the lab. And then in the lab, we do some further experimental tests uh, which truly tell us how good they actually are. So the molecules we find in virtual screening and the ones which also work quite well can then become the kind of blueprint uh, for a frataxin replacing drug. So overall, we're making really good progress and um, we really hope that our research will lead to a new drug that can help people with FA. So thank you for, for listening. And if you have any questions, I'm, I'm all yours. All right, thank you, Christian. Um, our first question looks like, does your virtual system only consider one interacting small molecule at a time? Could combinations better replace protection function? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great question, actually. Yeah, at the moment, we're just looking at one interaction at a time. Um, so, so the lab of Benoit, they've been working on this system for, for a long time now, and um, they've managed to really kind of functionally see what part of Frataxin is the most important. And it's this part which we're trying to really uh, replicate. Um, but I think, yeah, if we do find some, some potential molecules which are working quite well, then for sure we can expand that to see if we can use some in combination to improve the efficiency of the first molecules that we found. But for now, we're just looking at one molecule binding at specific sites. All right, awesome. And then we have another from Jeffrey. He says, thanks, Christian. Can you give us an idea of how many of the 80,000 molecules are good for taxon replacements? Yeah, that's also a really nice question. So at the moment, we kind of uh, rate them from best to worst. So um, for example, we, we, we can look at a kind of distribution and we're just looking at the best ones that fit. So in virtual screening, it doesn't really find perfect answer it's more experimentally where we can verify that um but for the virtual screening just as an arbitrary example we used around the top five percent of the top binders and then we took these into the lab and then we're better characterizing these and we found some hits through this all right we've got two more questions um the first one says what is the average MW of the small molecule protaxin mimics? Yep. Oh, small. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, so, so the molecular weight that we're using is generally between, I think it's around 150 to 500 Daltons. Um, we don't want to go out of that range because then we kind of have a trade-off where maybe we have better binders, but um, in terms of bioavailability and kind of... Uh, cell penetration, then we, we lose a lot of efficiency. So we focused on ones between around 150 and 500 Daltons. Um, and we find that this range has the best, uh, the best uh, outcome. Awesome. And I think is we have one more, time for one more. Yeah, please. Um, our final question for you, Christian, looks like, have you found many molecules yet that excite your team? Yeah, yeah, we've had, uh, we've had some promising results so far. Uh, one of the important things to do is to, to, uh, to characterize all of the way to make sure that the molecules are doing exactly what we think they're doing. Um, but we have a really good uh, researcher who'll be joining the team in summer, and uh, he'll be characterizing the ones that we've found so far. So we have a, a positive outlook and 
some, some good early results that show that this process uh, can provide some good results. So we're definitely happy with how it's going at the moment and we look forward to carry on working in this direction. Christian, thank you. I have a question for you, maybe. I'll, I'll insert one more final question. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, I couldn't help but wonder, you know, as you go through this screening and you find um, molecules that kind of are higher, have higher affinity and they will have a certain structure um, or certain characteristics about them, can you also use this kind of approach not only to find a molecule among the 80,000, but to inform sort of a custom design? Like, is it possible to then work with medicinal chemists or people yeah. who understand more about like making new chemical entities to see if, if you can make something new and custom if by taking the, the best bits of what you learned from the 80,000? Yeah, no, absolutely. And actually, um, so a lot of the molecules from the library, they have analogs. So already, if we find some, uh, some, some good binding molecules, which, which seem to replace Vitaxa nicely, uh, then we can actually go back and talk to the chemists who originally uh, synthesized these. And we can also search analogs, which basically takes the, the main structure that we like, and it has little functional groups added to, or it's extended this way. Um, so this, this kind of lets us explore similar molecules uh, which would hopefully be better and also yeah we can just rationally design these molecules to add uh, essential functional groups to improve them um, but we haven't designed a molecule from the ground up we're really just looking through virtual screening taking the basis blueprint and then uh, building on that through either the analogs or hopefully in the future rational design thank you okay well thank you all we can introduce our next presenter. All right, uh, next up we have Maheshwan Kesvan from Massachusetts General Hospital. And he'll be talking about GA instability and therapeutic targets for FA. Thank you for the introduction. Hi, I'm Mahesh, a graduate student in Moro Pinto Lab. Um, I started working in FA when I found out that one of my friend's brother had FA. Uh, it was an undergrad, so from that point, I started working on FA, trying to find some therapy, therapy for to cure FA. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about whether somatic GA expansions can be a potential therapeutic target for FA. What are somatic GA expansions? We know that expansion of GA repeats in the frataxin gene causes FA. The longer the repeat, the lower the protein that is made. These long GA repeats tend to form abnormal structures in the DNA. As a maintenance process, these structures need to be resolved. DNA repair proteins are found to resolve these structures. A specific protein called MSH3 that is found to arrive at the site first and recruits the other repair proteins. On the course of repairing these structures, these structures expands the GA repeats. Patients are born with GA repeats of similar sizes. Here is a picture that's showing neurons with 500 repeats. These repeats expand throughout a patient's life in cell and tissue specific manner and leads to less frataxin being produced. We hypothesize that this somatic instability is responsible for the disease progression. If that is true, we want to suppress the somatic instability by knocking out the DNA repair protein and in turn slow down the symptoms or the disease progression. You, generally, all the DNA repair proteins are associated with cancer, whereas MSH3 is not. We want to investigate this further to address the question whether somatic GA instability is responsible for the disease progression. 
So we designed an experiment where we have a mouse model which has 800 GA repeats and has shown to have somatic instability. We have another mouse where we knocked down this MSS3, the repair protein, and we amplified the GA repeats and we ran it in an agrose gel to size these repeats where we found that the striatum in the brain shows a significant level of instability and other neuronal tissues such as cortex, cerebellum, and spinal cord when compared to the tail, which we call it as a stable tissues. If we knock down this MSH3 protein, we can see the suppression of somatic instability in all the neuronal tissues. With that, we want to ask the question, does this somatic instability impact the frataxin levels? Even further, does it improve the phenotype of the mouse? Does it improve the motor coordination of the mouse? If from this mouse study, we see that somatic instability is responsible for the phenotype, we want to investigate this further in patient cellular models by establishing a model to study the somatic instability in cardiomyocyte and proprioceptic neurons and see whether we can rescue the phenotype that's presented by these cellular models. With that, I want to thank Farah and Locus for supporting this project. And I want to thank my supervisor, Dr. Ricardo. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. All right, we have a question from Sanjay. Uh, thanks, Mahesh. Striatum seems to show a lot of somatic instability, similar to the CAG in HD. Does this reflect something about striatum rather than FA biology? Um, a great question. So that's one of the things uh, we want to no, so in HD, we know that the striatum is affected. Um, so we don't know whether that's the case in FA. And I think maybe different tissues have different thresholds for how much mutational load it can hold up. And the pathogenicity of HD is different from uh, FA. The another thing we notice is that in HD mouse model we have, the cerebellum doesn't expand that much. But in FA mouse model we have, the cerebellum do expand. So I think it's, I don't think it's um, the striatum itself. Maybe it could be, but uh, but I don't think that's the case. Um, Mahesh, I kind of have a, a two-part question, um, and I think you might have answered one, but I just want to make sure. Uh, do GA expansions differ in different cell types in the same person? And then um, what you're studying now, is it targeted towards, I know you talked a lot about the cerebellum and seems like narrow pathways, does it target that over say cardio or other cells? Or is it um, more of a blanket approach? So the first part of your question, yes, somatic instability is very dependent on the cell and the tissue and it happens at a different rate. Or, so we don't understand exactly what's the rate and what cell types uh, as such. So, your second part of your question was uh, whether we are trying to target specific tissues, right? Yes. Um, so, it would be not specific tissues because we have seen instability happening in most of the disease relevant tissues. Um, so, we want to target a variety of different tissues and not just one. Okay. 
So, so here in, in, the, in the work that you've shown us, you've looked in the brain and you're going to look in neurons, but you're, you'll also look in cardiomyocytes or in the, the heart tissues from the mice as well? Yes. All right. Uh, Jen, do we have time for another question? Yes. Okay. I have a question from Raphael. Uh, do the repeat in this structure is stable during lifetime, or do they increase the number of repeats within time? Um, so by structure, you mean the loops that's shown here? Um, no, they are not. And um, they, they tend to attract these uh, DNA repair proteins and in turn increase the repeats. I know this question may be not, it's sort of the, the opposite, right, of, of what, or it, it goes in maybe a slightly different direction than what you're looking at, but I'm curious, um, are there are there ways to promote contraction of the repeats, right? That you know we you've explained that we know that they can expand, and we know we know different um, proteins or other genes that can interact that make the expansions even longer. But do we know about the opposite? Like, are there contractions that can occur? Are there things that we can do to promote contractions? Um. So if if it's something to do with the repair proteins, uh, I'm not sure. Um, so MSH3 were shown to contract during the intergeneration. So from one mouse line to another mouse line, sometimes they show, if you knock out MSH3, they show contractions. Um, but as a, as a drug, I think, uh, if I'm not wrong, there were few drugs that showed um, no, I don't think, so we, we need to investigate this further. So at this point, I don't think we have something that can contract the repeats. Thank you. This is from Denise. If repeats expand with the age, does this cause progress, uh, progression of FA? That's that's my hypothesis. That's what we are trying to address. That's the question we also have. Thank you. Right. If that is our last question, we can go ahead to our final presenter for today. We have Miss Francesca Fioretta with the University of Rome Tor Vergata. And she will be discussing what is wrong with gut bacteria in FA. Miss Francesca, go ahead whenever you're ready. Thank you for the presentation. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Francesca, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher of the uh, Physiology Laboratory of the University of Rome Tor Vergata, directed by uh, Daniele Lettieri Barbato and Katia Aquilano. As we all know, uh, the FA is caused by GAA expansion in the uh, protaxin gene. Uh, this causes a, a decrease of the content of the protein uh, protaxin, uh, leading to the development of neurodegenerative disease. We know that there is a correlation between the neurodegenerative disease and dysbiosis, uh, namely the dysfunction of our um, gut microbiota. And so we want to investigate also the, um, the condition of the uh, microbiota in our FA mice model. We found that uh, there is a, a decrease uh, on, of uh, um, bacteria producing booty rate uh, in our mice with FA. 
The debutyrate is a, a molecule usually produced by the bacteria in our gut and is well, well studied because uh, he, he, this, this molecule has an um, anti-inflammatory and neuroprotective effect. So uh, our hypothesis is could the butyrate produced by our gut bacteria have a protective role also in our FA disease? To answer this question, uh, we uh, feeded the ilt wild type mice and the FA Kiko mice with the butyrate. And to uh, verify the mobility capacity of these mice, we performed a rotor -rot test in which we placed the mice on our, our uh, rotating cylinder and we counted the number of folds of the mice. Then as expected, we found that the mice with the FA, the Kiko mice, show a, an higher number of folds when compared with wild type mice, the normal mice. But the number of the, the, of the number of folds decreased when the Kiko mice, the FA mice, were fitted with a booty rate. So the booty rate is able to improve the motility capacity of our FA mice. Since it's known also that there is a correlation between the uh, mobility um, dysfunction and neuroinflammation, we want to test the protective effect of the booty rate also on microglial cells, the tire cells um, that live in our brain. So we uh, generated a, um, a FA model uh, of cells in which we decrease the frataxin protein content and we treated the cells with LPS, that is a molecule able to induce the inflammation, and with LPS in addiction with the booty rate. As we can see, the LPS is able to induce the inflammation. As we can see here, this, uh, the cells are set. And uh, we can see here that there is an increase of the NOS2, that is a typical um, uh, inflammatory marker. And uh, um, interestingly, the prataxin deficiency cells seems to be more susceptible to the inflammation induced by the LPS. And as we can see here, the cells are frying. But the, the booty rate treatment is able to prevent the inflammation induced by the LPS. So the cells seems to be happier when are treated with the booty rate. Another notable uh, evidence is that after the uh, inflammation um, induction by the LPS, the cells induce the increase of a protein that is HCAR2. This protein is a butyrate transporter get, that gets the butyrate inside the cells. And interestingly, the cells seem to uh, need more butyrate inside to fight the, um, to fight the, uh, the inflammation induced by the LPS. And this um, aspect is more evident in the uh, prataxin deficiency cells. So uh, in conclusion, our data suggests the use of the beauty rate as a safe and valuable molecule capable of, the re of reducing the uh, inflammation and also the symptoms associated with the FA. I want to uh, thank my supervisors Daniela and Katia, uh, the para for the support, and you all for the attention. Awesome, thank you. Um, I was going to ask, is there any, um, with your research, is it like looking like an anti-inflammatory diet would just be something that we could all incorporate? as a benefit to us? Or do you think that it's done, it's a lot more studying? So uh, the diet is important because uh, we uh, get the, the booty rate with uh, uh, some type of food, such, such as the butter, the cheese, or milk, yogurt, or we can get some probiotics and prebio uh, prebiotics to improve the capacity of our bacteria to produce booty rate. So the, it seems that the diet is important. And we have a question it says from Mr. C&J, says, Ciao Francesca, does that mean the diet may modify the phenotype? 
in FA? Um, as we have seen in the mice, uh, the booty rate is able to prevent the motility um, problems that we observe in the, in, in the FA mice. So probably if we can uh, increase the booty rate production in uh, also in, uh, in our, um, in, uh, in the guts of the patients, maybe we will see, I don't know if <laughs> we are so lucky to see it, but uh, we hope that we see an improvement of the mobility capacity also in our patients. There are also a lot of um, pharmacological um, molecules that contains booty rate that are able to, um, that we can prove uh, if they are able to uh, improve the, the mobility of the, of the patients. I don't know if it will be uh, if, if we, we will be lucky, but we hope. Thank you. Um, we also have a question from Michael. Mm -hmm. What hypothesize is the mechanism of the booty rate benefit on the FA models as an HDAC inhibitor or as a substrate for oxidation? We know that the uh, booty rate uh, is, is, is able to um, interact with the, this protein that is HCAR2. And uh, we are now studying the mechanism um, by which maybe the booty rate is able to um, induce the transcription of antioxidant pathways uh, through the uh, induction of an ERF2 uh, protein that is a, a typical antioxidant uh, uh, pathway. And uh, now we want to study um, the um, a molecule that is able to inhibit the interaction between booty rate and HCAR2. And so, and we, we, we hope that we will see the, the, uh, the decrease of the effect that we see with, with the booty rate to prove that uh, the booty rate links to the HCAR2 and do the uh, induction of NRF2 protein and so the antioxidant genes. Now we are studying um, the molecular mechanism. Very... Francesca, um, Kaylee, can I ask a question? Yes. yes. So um, Francesca, do we know if people with FA have low butyrate levels in their gut? Uh, you, you told us about the mice, right? Mice, the mice yeah. have low um, butyrate, but do we know that people with FA also have low butyrate? We have to check this because we only um, uh, work now with the mice. And uh, now we also want to, uh, because we now only know that there are the decrease of the bacteria producing butyrate. Now um, we are, um, uh, we want to verify also if there is a decrease of the booty rate content in the sera of the mice and in the future also in the sera of the of the FA patients. Okay. So and, and that's something that you're gonna be looking into next. Yes. Excellent. Sounds like we, we've gone, I feel like we went full circle, we went full circle because I think Francesca, some of your results might give Fred some, some ideas for other, other compounds to test um, <laughs> in his, you know, trying to find antioxidants as well. Um, so I want to um, thank um, our moderators, Kaylee and Brian, um, for facilitating our discussion today. Thank you so much. Um, and really thank all of our presenters. Um, I think you all did a really great job. I know we give you a tough task of taking um, all of the complex research that you're doing and the science that you're working on and try and explain it to us in five minutes or less and in lay language. And I think you all did an awesome job of that. And um, just want to acknowledge you and thank you. For folks who joined us, stay on, don't close your browser. When we end the session, you'll be able to vote for our presenters today. And so I think with that, uh, one final reminder, our last flash talk 
for the month will be next Thursday at noon and hope you'll all join us then. All right. Thank you everyone and have a good afternoon and please vote.